a bustling ordinary town, full of disagreements and passions. The guys are sitting drinking in a karaoke room, trying to talk one girl, whose appearance is quite attractive, into having a drink with them. The girl awkwardly refuses, she clearly feels uncomfortable in this company, and lightly clutches her skirt with her hands while looking away from the alcohol. The microphone flies off to the side abruptly. A strange guy bursts into the room and immediately flies into one of the older guys with all his might, and then kicks another one in the face and he falls to the other end of the room. The stranger starts beating up all these cocky guys who decided to make fun of the girl. A fire extinguisher, empty bottles, and other things fly off. The girls who were with them run up to the victims, not understanding anything. Everyone immediately wonders who the guy is that beat these guys up. But he doesn't seem to know who he is either. Once upon a time, there was a very ordinary guy who, to protect the girl he loved, began to learn and use martial arts techniques. He beat tough guys and bad guys. The artist who draws manhwa for days and nights. Jagwa Kim is a manhwa at the age of 24. He looks visibly tired after a hard and fruitful night full of drawing. His face is stubbly, his hair is ungroomed, and he is dressed in a plain and simple t-shirt. Moving away from his desk, he decides he needs to rest. His whole body is already aching from fatigue and lack of sleep. But the man Waka does not live alone, but with his little daughter Di Young, a four-year-old preschooler, who is sleeping so sweetly and sweetly right now. While Jay Hua was being adored by the little darling, she woke up and was already full of energy and energy at once, with a huge desire to play. Unlike her father, who is terribly tired and just finished working, asking his daughter to play later. Ignoring these words, De Young is already planning what to play with her daddy. The girl thinks for a while before making a serious decision and chooses to go to Lot World. But luckily, Jaywa is saved by his wife, Sina Yu, also 24 years old and a housewife by profession. She explains to her daughter affectionately and a little sleepily that daddy is tired and can't play with her now. But Dae Young immediately finds a strong argument that daddy better not work then. Her mother keeps explaining to her that if daddy doesn't work, then they won't have any money and daddy won't be able to buy her sweets. The girl continues to argue, saying that in that case, her mother would be able to buy candy. Sina says that daddy needs a vacation now anyway, but her daughter continues to insist and still wants to play. This pisses the girl off and she's already dragging Dae Young into the other room. Jaywa can finally get some sleep, but he feels some guilt for not paying attention to his daughter. Sleep is stronger after all, and he falls asleep. He wakes up a few hours later to the noise of a vacuum cleaner, and his first thought is where Dae Young is. It turns out she's in prep school right now, but her father really wants to see her now. Jaywa's wife at first didn't really approve of the idea, as the teachers wouldn't like Dae Young being picked up in the middle of classes, but after much persuasion, Sina still broke down and decided that just today they would do it. The parents rush to their daughter contentedly, and on the way they decide to stop by the grocery store to buy the teacher coffee and Big Kim an ice cream. As Jaywa waits for his wife in the car, he's already daydreaming about how Dee Yum will react when they arrive, pick her up, take her wherever she wants to go. And it will clearly be Lot's world and Daddy will play with his little girl all day long. But not everything happens the way we want it to. Everything happens within a couple of seconds a red truck flying in and crashing into his car, pushing it back several meters, breaking it almost completely and toppling it to the ground with tremendous power. Jaywa Kim is dead. He sees his grave photo tied with a black ribbon, sees his grieving wife and De Young, wearing black funeral clothes. But she's not crying or sad, she's smiling and trying to make others smile as she offers the guests spicy beef stew. Right now she doesn't yet understand why everyone is sad and sitting in their black robes. She doesn't yet understand that her daddy is dead. Jaywa looks at her and feels incredible pain and longing, remembering how she was born, opened her eyes, took her first steps, had fun with him, experienced troubles and new sensations. And there was so much more he wanted to do with his little girl, but did not have time. Now all he has to do is be happy for her and have to protect her. At the sound of a desperate plea and goodbye came a stranger in black suit. He saw him and stood right in front of him. This guy came to find him. And now, Jaywa, Kim's soul will forever remain in this world to look after his daughter. Time flew by and Dae Young became a senior in high school. And right now, in front of the whole school, I'm making a public confession of my feelings to her. The boy is almost on his knees. He is dressed in expensive and branded clothes. There are heart-shaped candles all around him. And he is holding a brand new iPhone in his hands. All the classmates are rapturously watching this 
and would definitely agree to such a proposal, but not the young. She quietly and awkwardly apologized, but it made the guy even angrier. Even though the guy wanted to protect her, because he simply felt sorry for her, but now he promises her that from now on she will be the main loser at school. A month later, there is some kind of investigation in the classroom. The teacher finds out who might have stolen a classmate's purse, saying that now would be the best time to confess to the theft. But from the last desk comes the voice of the boy, the same one whose feelings were rejected, and says that Kim Dee Young stayed in class during gym class. The teacher turns out all of her things, and it turns out that the wallet is really in her possession. The girl is totally confused and doesn't know how it could be there, because she definitely didn't take it, and she is strictly told to come to school tomorrow with her parents. Her other classmates purposely start making jokes about Dee Young not having a full family and not having a father. Jabwa Kim is watching all of this. He hasn't been to his daughter's school in a long time, but after seeing her suspicious bruises, he decides to check on her. He really wants to help her somehow now, but all he can do is watch this bullying. Continuing to blame himself as he does, Jabwa decides that now all the bastards that would hang around his daughter will be finished off with his own hands. The next day, De Young came to school with her mother, but her father was with them too, even though they didn't see him. The girl's mother looks quite young, but her eyes are tired, faded, worn out, and her clothes are all shabby and dilapidated, and instead of a high-end branded purse, there was an ordinary eco-bag from the supermarket. The teacher immediately starts claiming that it was De Young who stole the purse, without even really looking into it, and attaches to all of this an allegedly not very good upbringing which was also affected by her father's death. The girl's mother stands up for her daughter, because the teacher didn't see that Dee Young did it, and moreover she doesn't behave appropriately for a teacher. The woman decides that she will simply transfer her daughter to another school. The teacher looks at her with surprise and looks at them. Dee Young is surprised that her beloved mother defended her, and their conversation takes place outside the school. The girl explains to her mom that it wasn't her, but she believes her and just like that. There are about 7 billion people on earth, and just because some people at school turn their backs on her, it doesn't mean that the whole world has turned its back on her. The woman supports her daughter with these words, even though she has been through quite a lot, she continues to smile just as sincerely and radiantly. Jay Wu's wife is a strong woman. In spite of all the reproaches from people, dirty rumors, hard life, small and cramped room, financial situation, she never ran away. And nothing has broken her. Even her husband's place is kept clean and in order. But it is now that Joanna's soul can rest in peace. Today is the first day at the new school. Dion is fussing and running all over the house, looking for the things she needs. And her mother prepares her breakfast, this woman still putting the first portion of rice where her husband used to sit. Today for breakfast is seaweed soup. Dion and Jehua's most unloved and already boring dish. But as mom says, this soup cleanses the blood and makes the head work better. It's her most favorite phrase. The girl's mom leaves already for work, but Dae Young keeps getting ready for school. She accidentally twisted her bangs too much and is now in front of the mirror trying to fix it somehow. Jae Wo is always beside her and thinks her daughter is the most beautiful and beautiful no matter what. Dae Young sadly walks over to the picture with her father, where she was still little and wonders, will she do well in her new school? She feels that her father, somewhere in heaven, hears her and will always support her and promises to try very hard this time. Jay Wad is proud of her little girl, and she is trying hard even now. A noisy new class with new people? Everyone hadn't really woken up before the first class yet. De Young walks into the classroom with her teacher. He introduces their newcomer to the class, Kim De Young, and asks her to sit in any empty seat. There are two empty seats, but one of them is actually taken by a student, Yua Jung, who hasn't come to school yet for some reason. De Young humbly sits down next to him. The teacher is a little angry that this brat is late again and asks one of the students to tell the latecomer to come to the teacher's lounge later. The girl feels terribly uncomfortable. A huge number of guys stand outside the classroom window and stare at her, admiring her immense beauty. Jadwa is still around, and he clearly doesn't like the way these guys are staring at his beloved daughter. The last desks are also discussing the new girl, wanting to talk to her and get to know her, but they think she'll just ignore them. They don't think she looks that special, and the prettiest girl in their class is Cho Yi Jai, who doesn't even know her looks. She doesn't even really listen to them and just sits on her phone without looking up. One guy talks to De Young though, and he's the head of the class, Hong Jae Ho. He smiles sweetly at her, and he looks adorable with that smile. 
The guy explains to her that she can go to him with all her questions. Jagawa likes this guy too. At least he looks the most adequate here. Hicha gets a little distracted by the phone, and without looking at the head teacher, says that his homeroom teacher was looking for him. The boy changes his face for a moment, but then, smiling sweetly again, turns to De Young, inviting her to come with him to the teacher's room to show him where the classrooms are. The girl doesn't mind at all and follows him, and now the very same Igi looks up from her phone. She clearly didn't like the fact that the new girl went along with the head girl. But this girl just looks elegant, with a kind of model-like appearance, not like the classmates who were now discussing De Young. And Cho Ijai offers to have fun with this new girl. A nice golden sunset envelops the city. School is out, so many teenagers either go home quietly or go relax with friends to local rooms with karaoke, drinks, and more. De Young's new classmates took her to one of those places. The girls offered her a cigarette, but she awkwardly declined since she had never smoked before. Jadwat is clearly unhappy that even children are allowed to smoke on the premises, and with a stern step, he goes to see what the owner is up to. On the way, he hears De Young's new classmates talking about her in a not particularly good tone from the next room. One of the most important in this company was D. San Ryol, also a student at Jinnil High School. Little De Young goes to school all alone right after her father dies. The children didn't want to communicate with her because they thought she was poor and stupid. She didn't have a daddy who could buy her some fancy cool things. The girl became more and more withdrawn every year, and she never had any friends. It was painful for Jabwa to watch his daughter being bullied and not accepted. And eventually, she became a brat. But now, Di Young is not alone at her new school. At least, that's what her father thought when he saw how his daughter's new classmates started to socialize with her and took her for walks around all kinds of places. Jabwa Kin was clearly happy for her and thought that Di Young was also over the moon, just not showing it yet. After a few cafes and stores, the girls went to a karaoke club, and they took out a pack of cigarettes and offered them to the new girl. She awkwardly refused, as she had never smoked at all. Janua is clearly unhappy that smoking is allowed on the premises of the place, even for children. And with a stern step, he heads off to see what the owner is up to. On the way, he hears some high school students from De Young's school talking about her in a not-so-good tone from another room. They find out that the girls are in the next room and decide to get the new girl drunk. Jadwa hears the whole conversation and realizes that his daughter is in danger, and these guys might do something to her. He runs up to De Young and tells her that it's time for them to go. He wants to take her hand, but he can't, because he's just a ghost, a soul. Now his daughter can't hear him, and because of this, he begins to panic. Because he can't do anything, he abruptly remembers one situation. Jadwa once met a boy on the street and was already a ghost when he saw him. Or, when a stranger in a black suit approached him when he had just died, the man ran out into the street and started screaming, calling for help and trying to get attention, hoping that at least someone could hear him. Jadwa runs as fast as he can, flying through people and already collapses to the ground without strength and continues to ask for help. Suddenly a guy comes up to him and asks if he's okay. Jadwa looks up in surprise and immediately asks the guy if he can see him. He thinks it's some crazy bum and plans to leave. But Kim prevents him from doing so and wants to grab his arm, but ends up in the guy's body. He feels the cold, the smell, the melodies. He's alive and has somehow entered this stranger's body. Thoughts of Dae Young immediately bring him back, and he remembers what he was looking for help for in the first place. Jae Hwa runs back to that karaoke club. At this time, these high school kids come into the girl's room and make Dae Young have a drink with them. She awkwardly refuses, she clearly feels uncomfortable with these guys and slightly squeezes her skirt with her hands while looking away from the alcohol. But the schoolboys continue to insist, arguing that they just want to get to know each other better. De Young picks up her backpack and plans to leave already. The high school student, he's sang real, grabs her hand and doesn't plan to let the girl go. He's angry that she turned him down for a drink and looks at her angrily. De Young gets scared and asks to let go of her hand, to which she is told that she should leave if she can, of course, leave. At this point, a contentedly big guy and another guy who doesn't look at the girl kindly stand outside the room. The huge guy who is blocking the way smirks, saying that this is the way out. Suddenly, the door opens with a colossal force from the other side. Jaywa, who is in the body of a strange guy, kicks the door open so hard that the big guy flies off to the other side of the room. Next, he kicks the other insolent guy in the face, which throws him back several meters as well. 
and Sangriol continues to hold the new girl. But then a fire extinguisher flies at him, and then this stranger pounces, who rolls him right onto the couch and starts beating him, before the girls start yelling at him, wondering who the guy who beat up their high school friends is. His hands were already bloody, and upon hearing this question, Jabawa woke up to the fact that he was now in a stranger's body, and just burst into the room, and started beating up strangers. He was immediately confused, not knowing what to say and pointing at Dayan, shouted that he was her boyfriend. Everyone looks at him in shock, and Sangriel, raising his head slightly, looked at the guy furiously, and ordered him and the girl to be grabbed. Jabwa is even more confused, and after shouting loudly that they should run away, the two of them run out of the place. Fortunately, they came off quickly and tiredly trying to catch their breath after such a run. Digum finally decides to thank her hero, and in turn the guy excitedly asks the girl if she's okay. Jadwa Kim gets spoiled again by calling his daughter by her name, and the girl wonders how this stranger knows her name. Nervously, the guy argues that she just looks the way a girl who would be called Di Young would look. Even though the guy is her age, he talks because of Jadwa straight up like an uncle. It does sound really funny. The guy decides to walk to Yan and Jaywa, out of habit, starts typing in the house password already. This really surprises the girl. And Kim doesn't know what to think of anymore, so he decides to just run away so as not to do anything else unnecessary. Jaywa strolls down a noisy street and ponders what's happening. He somehow managed to inhabit the body of a stranger. He walks, not even knowing where he's going next or what to do now. The man decides to go through his pockets, but there isn't even a phone, and but there was one. It's just that when Jagua first moved into the boy, he was so worried about his daughter that he even accidentally threw the phone away. Thoughts are interrupted by a feeling of hunger that he hasn't felt in a very long time, but the kid doesn't have any money either, so he just keeps going nowhere. Until suddenly, this stranger guy starts owning his body again and doesn't understand anything now. The next morning, this guy comes to his school. As it turns out, he's studying with Dae Young, and it was his seat that was empty the day she first arrived. The past king is Yu Jun. His friend, the cutie of the class, is Ho Xiu, who also sits in front of him, wondering why he didn't show up to school yesterday. Jun sits down tiredly in his seat and has absolutely no recollection of what happened yesterday and is not at all aware of the fight he had and how he saved a girl he didn't know. Xu thinks he's just pretending to be sick and wonders if that would be a good excuse for a teacher. Digun walks into class and immediately notices this guy a little surprised that they are studying together. They cross each other's eyes but don't exchange a single word. The girl thinks that he's just ignoring her or this guy just looks like that stranger from yesterday. Digun's classmates, who were with her yesterday, noticed him too and started sitting around gossiping about it. Yi Jai only grinned. At this time, the two seniors whom Jun had beaten up yesterday pushed his chair, throwing him straight to the floor. They were clearly unkind and angrily ordered him to follow them. The guys took him to the back of the room and held him against the wall and started beating him. The boy is confused and does not understand what they are talking about and why they are beating him. A crowd of school children has already gathered and are discussing his origins in a fierce manner. Sangriol turns out to be a pretty strong and violent high school student, so this guy got involved with him for nothing. Jaywa is silently watching all of this. He's the reason all this is happening, and now this guy is suffering, not even of his own free will. The red-haired high school student, who is holding Jung, starts threatening him that he's going to put holes in his body. He first punches his classmate in the stomach with all his might. The boy twists in pain and holds his hand to the spot where the blow landed. He really doesn't understand what he did. Sangriol is watching all of this. Even though Jun says he doesn't remember anything, he thinks that, as a sunbae, they should teach Hu a lesson. Such are the laws of education, after all. PR. Hubei is the youngest. Sunbae is the eldest. The red-haired guy agrees with him and decides it's time to take it up a notch and make a hole now in Jun's head and start swinging. Suddenly, his fist is stopped by the man he just beat up. It's as if he has changed again and is now acting more confident. Holding his opponent's fist, Jun thinks it's pretty dumb to talk before he strikes. The high schooler looks at him in shock and doesn't understand what's going on with this weirdo at all. Yu Jun continues his moralizing, saying that schools should be about learning, not about getting into fights. Now his gaze is filled with confidence, courage, and now he will teach his bullies a lesson. Jadwa has moved back into the guy's body and will now try to make things right. The kid who beat up Yu Jun is clearly not the main one here. 
Sangriel is the most important opponent here, and if Jadwa can teach him a lesson, then his servants will bow their heads too. After wrestling himself out of the hands of the guy who was beating him up, he rushed toward the ringleader. But that was not the case. He clearly had more servants than Kim thought, and they swooped down sharply and started kicking him. The first lesson in moralizing was over for today. The red-haired bully told June to come to their house every break. Real school lessons started with math. The teacher explains functions and graphs, comparing them with our lives. For example, if X changes, then Y will also change, just like in life when a certain choice changes the result. That's the pattern. But Jay Watt is not at all concerned with lessons right now. He's thinking about something of his own. Jung's friend worries about him and asks what happened in the first place, because this main guide is Sang Riol of the Gang of Twelve. A little confused, Jade Hua asks what the gang is all about. Of course, she was a little surprised that he knew them, but turning on the explanation mode started his story. Every year at Chinel School, the strongest bullies are traditionally sent an animal. It turns out that the number 12 is from the Chinese zodiac. Rat, bull, tiger, hare, dragon, snake, horse, ram, monkey, rooster, dog, pig. And these 12 pupils, when they graduate, pass their animal to the next tube. The selected 12 people get a tattoo of the 12 signs of the zodiac. The rite of passage for the new ranks is the gang anthem. When the driver stretched out AICA All My Wolves to AUPH, everyone lines up and watches as the newcomers get their tattoos tattooed. Once those get the position, they can take over the other guys. But the subordinates can only get tattoos of the animal they report to. Those guys who beat up Jun are subordinate monkeys. Shu is very worried about his friend and doesn't understand what Jun could have done to those menacing guys. Jaywa, after hearing all this, thinks it's just some kindergarten thing. Now the lesson is over and a serious Kim is about to go to those seniors to finish what he started. Shu suggests that it's better to tell someone from the adults, but they don't listen to him. Even though Jaywa thinks these guys are just silly bullies, their actions could touch De Young again if he doesn't end it all now. Looking at the girl, he looks very much intimidated. In De Yen's eyes, he looks like just another scary bully who likes to swing his fists. Jaywa thanked the bespectacled man for worrying about him, and he only said that it looks like his friend got hit in the head a couple of times after all. In earnest, Kim begins to make a plan on his way to the right office. It is important to eliminate the main man first, of course, but on his way there will be a russet-haired guy who looks like an anchovy. So the first thing to do is to eliminate him by attacking him right in the chimes. And while everyone is distracted by him, you can head for their main man. If Jaywa can overpower him, he will win immediately. But in the end, it didn't work out the way he wanted it to. Opening the door with his foot, Kim sees this picture. The school children gathered in a circle, like in the Colosseum, and looking at him. Fact from Ancus, the Colosseum was built in Rome, in the form of a circle where spectators could watch two warriors fight in the middle. Jaywa feels someone put a heavy and large hand on his shoulder, which had a tattoo of a monkey on it. This strongman is Park Chan, oh, 18, smirking slightly, looking at the boys and asking if he's ready for their second lesson. Kim realizes he's in trouble. He comes back to class beaten, and the next class they have is history, the guys are repeating old topics and will be preparing for a test, which will be another time. Even though Kim got it from the upperclassmen at recess, he goes back to them to finish it. And here comes the next lesson, the teacher explaining another lesson. But Jaywan in Yuwa Jum's body looks even worse than that time. This is not the case at all, and he clearly needs a detailed and normal plan. He spends the whole lesson doing just that. And Kim is about to go to the seniors again, already with at least some kind of plan. Shu is very worried about his friend, because he might die that way, but his words are ignored again. At this point, Young's classmates, who were with her yesterday, start pestering her. They wonder what the girl is going to do, since it looks like she will only see her boyfriend in his coffin today. She can't understand what they're saying at first, but when she saw the strange man who called himself her boyfriend at the karaoke machine yesterday, she was sure that Yu Hajun is her boyfriend. And it was because of her that it turns out that high school students are beating him up. The girl angrily pushes back her chair, the case pinching her classmates' fingers, and disgruntledly gets up from behind her seat, heading in the direction of the senior's office. Diem feels obligated to help him now, but Jaywa is very formidable this time, and this time his plan will definitely work. At the next break, Jaywa, in the body of teenager Yu Jung, didn't show up. A new class was about to start, so the seniors felt that they couldn't miss their training, so they personally went to pick him up.
Sangrio, on the other hand, stayed in class, continuing to play some game on his phone. Ahead of him came someone's evil giggling. At the same time, Kim De Young ran out of the office to get Jun, who ran back to the seniors. Xu, in turn, was very worried about his friend, in case he got beaten to death. He was already planning to get up and tell the teacher everything. But when he turned around, he saw Yu Jun's notebook on the table, where he had written a plan and a note that there would only be one student against him, so Xu should not worry. The plan was as follows. The one who is behind everyone and farthest away from everyone else is the ringleader. You have to catch him. But if you go in through the back door, his subordinates would catch him right away. So you have to go in through the front door. Except that the distance to Sang Raiol will be too long and Jaiwa will be caught 100%. The only way to sneak up close to him and stay undetected is to cover up. An ingenious plan. Kim pulled his sweatshirt over his head and walked like that to his office. The main disadvantage was the long corridors, and he ran into students a couple of times along the way. The subordinates had already left the office, and at that moment, Jay Wo managed to enter, and was in front of the ringleader. It was his evil giggle because his plan had succeeded. And then the attack. When you fight one-on-one, -on -one, the outcome of the battle is determined by who attacks first. And Sangriol sits there like a slot machine that you just want to hit. It's as if the one is saying, hit me but he forgot about his feet, so he got kicked right in the face. The schoolboys immediately came running and started packing up. Hearing the start of some kind of fight, the ringleader got up from his seat and took off his shirt, angrily looking at his victim, not believing at all that this boy had any chance of beating him. Sanrio began to attack. First a blow came to his face, then to his stomach, and then again to his face, but this time with his knee. Jai Wu fell to the floor, almost knocked out. Yesterday this ringleader had been drunk, but now he was feeling better, and as it turned out he had also studied martial arts. Doing a somersault, Kim gets back to his feet and breathes heavily, looking at his opponent. The fact that he was beaten this morning makes him feel weaker, but he doesn't give up. Sang Riel taunts him to stop being a tough guy already and just give up. Suddenly, Jay Wu just bows his head, folds his palms, and accepts his defeat and starts apologizing and making excuses. But this is just part of another plan. All done to shorten the distance, and the opponent will hesitate, which means that his concentration will decrease. Consequently, it would be easy to get hit in the face. But the ringleader dodges Kim's punch and is already aiming to hit him with an uppercut, only he fails. Jehua grabs him and holds on tightly to him, not letting him go for a second. Sangriel continues to punch him in the side with his fists, but due to the lack of distance between them, he barely feels anything. His opponent gets even angrier and slams him with all his might against the window, which shatters with a rattle. The searing pain spreads throughout his body, and even though Kim's hands and Yua Jung's body are already trembling, he still continues to hold his opponent. Sang Riel already just wants this clingy guy to just die. That last phrase really hurts Jae Hua, because this high school kid has absolutely no idea what it's like to be dead. The enraged guy opens his mouth, and with all his remaining strength, bites the ape leader in the neck, so to speak, biting through all those muscles, and he just collapses on the floor. By this point, his subordinates had come into the office. Through the huge crowd of school children, they saw their head lying unconscious, and the young man they were beating up standing right beside him. The red-haired guy swings a chair at Jaywa, but just one devilish look from him is enough to know that it's better not to touch him. The guys abruptly pretend that they're just supposedly studying and sit quietly at the desk. Kim, who is still in Jun's body, threatens all the students that if anyone touches Kim De Young, he will tear them to pieces. And on that day, the students from the 10th grade saw the sea split in two and Moses, Yu Jun, walk in the middle. After that, Joa felt his daughter's support for the first time. When the boy walked out of the classroom right at the door stood De Young, her eyes filled with tears and wonder. They walked together to their classroom. The girl helped her protector walk and on the way she sincerely thanked him and apologized for not recognizing him the first time. Jaiwa feels somewhat relieved that he's finally able to protect his little girl and leaves Yu Jung's body. The boy is finally back in his body, and the first thing he feels is incredible pain. Falling to his knees and grabbing his head, he starts screaming and accusing Dae Young of being the one who beat him up. The girl understands absolutely nothing and stares at him in shock. The man wakes up at the intersection of the supermarket, the place where he died. After the first time, Kim was in this guy's body. He also woke up in the place where he died. Sitting on the road, 
Jaywa reflected on the fact that when he sneezed, he was coming out of his body, except that his thinking was interrupted by the thought that it was the next morning, which meant that Dee Young was already at school and needed to check on her. The usual boring class. Yuijinus sprawled out on his desk and rests his head on his desk. Dee Young looks at him and remembers the scene yesterday when abruptly this weirdo, after fighting for her, pretended he didn't know who she was at all. The first thoughts that came up was that this guy was just a psycho. Although, it didn't seem like such a person at all. In the meantime, June anxiously searches the internet for why and what has been going on with him at all lately. Jehua finally comes running to school and is happy that his little girl and this kid are okay. And all the students discuss the defeat of Sangriol of the Gang of Twelve, and now he and his subordinates are officially turned into outcasts. After the news spread about how they lost to the Nine Classics, the ringleader forcibly erases their tattoos and turns them into official outcasts of the school. Jangwa watches these high schoolers crawl on all fours to the auditorium and get humiliated. Let them know they shouldn't touch his little girl. And here comes the lunch break. The cute Ho Chu asks his friend if he's sure he won't be going to lunch, but Jun just grumbles through his desk that he'd rather sleep. Jaywa looks at the kid and feels a little bad for getting beaten up, and he doesn't even really understand the reason why. He apologizes to him, but after all, dinner is sacred and shouldn't be skipped. So went back into Yuva Jun's body. Those same day young classmates are sitting in the cafeteria discussing what they're going to do now. After all, their ops lost and now they don't know what they're going to do with them. Jaywa comes up to them with a tray with just a bunch of food on it. The girls grudgingly start saying why this glutton sat down with them in the first place and no one invited him here. But he doesn't listen to them at all because now he is enjoying the taste of food with such pleasure and that he can finally feel it for real. This dinner is just something divine to him. After eating everything except, of course, the seaweed soup, Kim decides to talk to these bitches. They pretend to be kind of cool, doing things that are forbidden to minors and don't even know that they're actually breaking the law. Janwa goes on and on about how they're going to regret what they've done when they grow up and the red mark in their lives won't go away. But they do not even listen to him and only smiling smirkingly, argue that they are just minors. And this guy had better take care of himself because he was the one who broke into the karaoke and immediately got into a fight. For this, he could be imprisoned. But the girls forgot that Kim, in Yu Ajun's body, was also underage and smirked smirkily at them. Rising from his seat, the guy said one last time that if they touched it Yun one more time, the school would turn into hell for those girls. He didn't ignore Yi Jun either, even though she didn't say a word and just went over her food in silence. Jad Wei advised her to eat normally and not be fussy because seaweed soup cleanses the blood and makes her head work better. Though he didn't finish the soup himself. The girl continued to stare thoughtfully into the distance after these words. It was getting late in the evening. A group of teenage girls have gathered near the Oak Entertainment Building near a tall and handsome pink-haired guy. They are clearly groupies and are trying to support their idol, showering him with wishes and compliments. From their conversation, it is clear that apparently, this handsome boy's agency did not allow him to make his debut. The guy speaks very politely and smiles sweetly. His name is Kwok Jai Ho, a student at Jinnil High School. One fan embarrassedly approached him saying that she wrote him direct, and even though he didn't respond to her, she still supports him. And the pink-haired guy, somehow knowing that the girl lives in a distant neighborhood, asks her caringly to go home now so she can catch the last bus. And the groupie just gets carried away by the overdose of such cuteness. Kwok Jai Ho says goodbye to everyone and is on his way out. As soon as he gets a couple of meters away from them, all this hypocrisy is shown and that he is totally indifferent to these teenagers. And he is a member of the Gang of Twelve. It's evening and a beautiful pink and yellow sunset envelops the whole city. After school, all the students are already going home. Jay Watt is still in Yua Jung's body and is wondering where he should go now because he doesn't know where the guy lives and he can't sneeze. Suddenly, Dae Young stops him and asks for a conversation. The guys walk into a deserted place, something like a park. The sunset has already turned bright pink, and the lanterns have already started to light up. Jaywa asks what the girl wanted to talk about, and she starts to tell him that she thought about his actions, that he saves the weak but doesn't fall down and means he's a superhero. The guy doesn't understand her and thinks that she just watched Spider-Man. After Dae Young carefully takes antiseptic and absorbent cotton out of his backpack, because if you just stick band-aids on these wounds, nothing will really heal. Suddenly they hear some strange noise behind them. It was getting late in the evening. 
A group of teenage girls have gathered outside the OC Entertainment Building near a tall and handsome pink-haired guy. They are clearly groupies and are trying to support their idol, showering them with wishes and compliments. The guy speaks very politely and smiles sweetly at them. One of the girls just fainted from such niceness. Kwak Jaho says goodbye to everyone and is on his way out. As soon as he gets a couple of meters away from them, all this hypocrisy and his total indifference to these young girls is shown. Once inside the building, there he meets his manager, who tells him about the situation and that it was better to go through the parking lot instead of the front door so he wouldn't meet these girls. But Java wanted to see these pigs and dogs who were going to see him. Handsome has a dance rehearsal with the band boys tonight on his schedule. He refuses because he doesn't want to practice and then be all sweaty. The manager slightly insists it's worth going because the director will be here soon. Jiho turns around to face him and smiles wickedly, asking if he isn't working hard enough as it is. That smile makes his blood run cold. He does look intimidating right now. Afterward, the manager awkwardly apologizes because he didn't mean to offend him. A group of rainbow boys are already practicing in the dance hall. All the dancers have their hair colored, they're just warming up, and Jaho comes in just as the boys are resting. They all smile sweetly at him and tell him it's no big deal that Jaho is late, they're just getting started. The pink-haired guy awkwardly excuses himself and says that he has to go into his office now and then he'll be back with them. When he gets into the elevator, Jaho's face immediately changes as he thinks his team is full of hypocrites too, pretending to be cute first and then shitting on him behind his back. He remembers a moment when one of the groupies reminded him today that it's all this father's company. But his father thinks he's just a worthless puppy who shouldn't even be trying to do dance. The pink-haired guy collapses tiredly on the couch in his office and, breathing heavily, closes his eyes for a second with the thought that this is all because of his father. He's not alone in his office. A couple of his subordinates are standing around staring at the ringleader, and on the iron bench sits the bound de Young in Yuba Jung, who still has Jay Wa in his body. Jai Ho is a little surprised that this squishy guy here won the battle against Sang Riol, now a former member of the Gang of Twelve. Rising from the couch, he heads toward them, wondering where he came from in the first place, and that maybe some other chapter sent him. The pink haired guy smiles hypocritically at them, and then turns his gaze to de Young and realizes that it's about this girl. As he walks closer to her, he pulls the tape off her mouth and puts his thumb on her chin, lifting her up and assessing her face. Jay Wu mutters exasperatedly through the duct tape to get this thing's hands off of her. His gaze is filled with rage and utter anger. Jay begins to laugh fakedly at what that scary look looks like. Continuing to mock, he turns to his subordinates and mocks Jay Wu. Leaning over to him, he plays with him as he can't hit him. His hands are taped tightly together. But all of a sudden, a hard fist hit his pretty face, that his nose immediately oozed blood and flew back a couple of meters to the couch. All the subordinates looked at him in surprise as they tied him up well. Kwak Ho is one of the ringleaders of the Gang of Twelve, the Monkey. His gaze now resembled that of a murderer. Licking his blood that flowed from his nose, he stared at his opponent abnormally. He's just a real psychopath. The training begins again. Tearing off the scotch tape, Jay Wa looks at them angrily, a moment earlier. Whispering softly through duct tape taped to their mouths, the boys use the lighter de Yan left behind after her former classmates gave it to her to melt the duct tape. When they get out, Jay Wa turns on the fatherly moralizing and wonders why his daughter hasn't thrown the lighter away yet. Though if she hadn't, who knows what would have happened. A disgruntled Jai Ho turns to them, so that, as he says, these lowlifes will pay attention to him at all and remember that they now have almost an entire gang of monkeys against them. They're out to fight in Kwok Jaho's office, where there's quite a lot of musical equipment. Dayan, though trembling with fear, is getting into a killer pose. Against them now are four subordinate monkeys and the actual ringleader himself, who is seated on the couch, stopping a nosebleed. Previously in a fight, Jaybaw tried to fight by all means, and won the battle with Sangriel only through wit and persistence. But this time, it will be different. After all, his opponents clearly don't look like school children, but like the very real bandits. But then, one of his subordinates approaches his ringleader, handing him a napkin and addressing him as a young. That is, this pink-haired, greasy-haired guy is older than they are. Their opponents are Kim Won Sung, 17 years old, General's apprentice, part of the Gang of Twelve, refers to the monkeys. Skill, crazy speed. He has a large scar across his face, and the rest of his face is covered by a mask. 
Don Kim Kong, 18 years old, also a disciple of Jinil, part of the Gang of Twelve, refers to the monkeys. Skill, monstrous strength. It's just a huge guy, and his body has veins protruding from a lot of muscles. Cho Sam Mo, 19 years old, also a disciple of Jinil, part of the Gang of Twelve, refers to the monkeys. Skill, one of a kind. The guy folds his arms and smiles sneeringly at his pathetic rival. Monkey Magic, 17, apprentice of Jinil, part of the Gang of Twelve, refers to the monkeys. Skill, an ace at kicking. He lifts his mask slightly and a nasty mustache protrudes on its face. J-Boy is shocked to see what kind of minnows he'll be fighting, but they look like they've been beaten up by life. The first punch he receives is a kick to the shoulder from mustachioed monkey. After safely blocking the blow, the guy tells De Young to let her hold onto his back and not be afraid of anything. Until death touched j he was an artist. More accurately, a man drawing his own comic strip about a tough high school boy named Jung Man who fought bad guys to protect the girl he liked. He was the only one who could take down a huge crowd at once. He trained hard to get even stronger and keep beating up the bad guys. It was an action and thriller-style manhwa about the best fighter with the title. Life is a test. But there was one small problem. Working out the movements during fights. Jaywa himself didn't fight, and it was hard to learn martial arts from a book. So he went to the Unified Martial Arts Hall. On his back in a special bag, his father always carried his daughter, who was sleeping peacefully and sweetly. After approaching the special trainer and explaining the whole situation, he looked at the drawing with interest and after saying that some of the blows were not quite right, he immediately demonstrated it on his student, who flew far and wide. And so Jaywa went around all the masters, of every kind of martial art. Each one showed him in detail how and in what certain situations he should strike correctly. And so, discussing movements with many masters, Kim memorized many movements with his eyes only. He certainly didn't see the need to apply all of this in his life, as he had no need to fight after he became a father. But now, with his theoretical knowledge of martial arts, will he be able to apply them in life? The opponent strikes next with his foot. You must have time to block it before the blow gains speed. Then stagger their balance with a counterpunch to the kneecap. And then take advantage of this moment to strike, directing all his strength to the arm. All of Jiwa's moves are exactly right, and the mustachioed monkey goes flying into a knockout, right at the feet of the other subordinates. Everyone looks at the not-so-simple kid with great amazement. Jiwa himself seems surprised that it all worked out, and it turns out that all the fighting techniques he drew became possible in Yuha Jun's body. Monkey Magic grabs his knee and twists in great pain, lost. Next attacking at breakneck speed is the guy with the scar, Kim Wonsung, and with him, the one and only Joe Sam Mo. Jadwa catches the first blow and breaks the scared guy's arm in the opposite direction. If this were a comic book, Jadwa would probably draw a picture or two with the small pawns first. But that's impossible now, because he's very strong himself. Next, the cocky Joe Sam Mo attacks, but his punch is also easily blocked, not in his favor, getting hit right between the buns. The ringleader gets up from the couch and keeps smiling slyly. And as he approaches Jadwa, he claps his hands in the same way. He pulls off his sweatshirt and begins to mock, taunting the guy. At first, Kim wonders for a moment if this minnow is even a gang leader. But then he realizes that all this talking and smiling is just a psychological trick to confuse his opponent. Kwak Jiho continues his childishness and makes himself look like a nice poor boy. This only makes him want to punch him harder and swinging at the same second. Jaywa almost gets kicked right in the face but manages to dodge by doing a backward somersault. And the leader of the monkeys is so fast and agile that it becomes problematic to understand his movements. While Kim was thinking, he already gets the next such a sprawling and fast kick, but again manages to block it. Attack after attack, and it only makes Jiho laugh as his opponent can't do anything to him now. And the problem is that this is the first time Jiwa has seen this kind of fight. The pink-haired guy again tries to somehow humiliate his opponent with his words while continuing to attack. But the latter has never once made an attack in response, but simply blocks every punch, taking a step closer and closer, and eventually driving the monkey into a corner. Such a place would be narrow for big movements, and Jaho is just trapped. Jahua swings his leg in the same way, but the punch just comes flying into the wall, not into his opponent, like a real monkey. With the help of acrobatics, Quack easily and quickly leaps over his opponent, standing flat on his feet. Out of surprise, J-Boy didn't have time to block the blow and got it in the face, leaning back a couple of meters. 
The pink-haired guy realized that this was the first time his opponent had seen such movement, and it was true. When Jaho was young, his parents often left him alone. The only thing that entertained him was the TV, which always showed different popular bands. One of them was called VTS, and when they performed showing acrobatic moves, Jaho was very much admired by them, and that's why he decided to become an idol too. While the pink-haired boy was telling his monologue from his childhood, he got punched again in his beautiful face. Jehua, having taken his opponent down, sat right on top of him, while pressing his knees against his shoulders. Now the cute monkey can't do anything and asks that he not be punched in the face again, but instead gets a few more punches. But Jamu didn't just say that because now the guy will only make it worse with those punches. Forgetting about another subordinate, Dong Kim Kong, who has now grabbed a Yan. But the girl can easily handle herself, biting this ambo in the arm, the latter abruptly let her go. And the already angry Jawa loudly yells to his daughter to duck, and epically flies like a true professional into the face of this bully. When Jawa was still alive, he and little Diyan gave their mom a little surprise by showing that the little girl had already learned to do the proper greeting and fold her arms on her belly. It was so darn cute, and the parents were hugging their lovely little girl with glee over it. Jadwa showed her how to do it right just once, and she remembered everything for the rest of her life. And now the father yells to his daughter to duck, and as if on reflex, she manages to do so. The kid epically flies like a pro into the face of this thug. Jadwa thinks he's done some damage to this mountain, but Kim Kong grabs his leg tightly before he does and starts twisting it around with all his might. He was monstrously strong and was also a gold medalist in throwing among schoolchildren all over the world. He ended up throwing Jaywa right into the musical instruments. The monkey boss clearly didn't like it and stood up angrily, reprimanding his subordinate. At this second, Kim gets a genius idea, taking one of some musical things. After all, this pink-haired trainee guy is in a music band. The trainee are aspiring artists who live, train and perform together from a milky age, ages nine and up, under the strict supervision of a music agency. Jaho did panic a little and decided to threaten to ask him to put the thing back. But just the phrase, or else you'll die, triggered the main character's trigger, and embittered, he threw the player to the ground. Dong Kim Kong decided to catch the thing in time, and thought that if he did, he put an end to his previous mistake. A year later, if the thug has already been kicked out of the gang, at the neuropsychiatry clinic, he sits in one of the rooms with a specialist, trying to overcome his psychological trauma. But in the end he fails and Dong Kim Kong goes nuts, and now he almost catches the player, but because of the volleyball hobby, his body moves already reflexively and folding his arms as if for a sword reception. The thing flies off into the wall, breaking into small pieces. Jai Wood clearly likes this, and picking up an expensive music speaker, he throws it as well and further smashes all the other equipment as well. Jai was almost destroyed materially. Taking the last thing, a hard drive with songs the pink-haired boy composed himself, Joa proceeds to reprimand the brash schoolboy for kidnapping his little girl. Jeho now pretends to feel weak and innocent, and bending his knees slightly, asks his rival to put down the disc, which is very important to him. But he himself at the same time slowly approaches him to take the thing away and attack Kim. The hero immediately understands what his plan is and, taking out a lighter, threatens to burn the disc if this monkey comes even a step closer to him. De Young opens the door and they are ready to leave but suddenly the lighter runs out of gas and goes out. This is noticed by the leader of the monkeys and his subordinate, who smiled and ran after them in pursuit. Having already run outside the building, the chase is still on, and if the two of them attack J1 now, he definitely won't stand a chance. So they shouldn't get caught, but run even faster. De Young is very good at it though, her hair developing from her speed and accidentally touching j nose, and he sneezes so ill-timed, leaving Yua Jung's body at that moment. Jaywa woke up the next morning at that intersection again. Immediately remembering De Yun, he rushed to his daughter's school, hoping very hard that nothing had happened to her. Yesterday they could barely make it out of the head monkey's lair, and they were running away from those thugs afterwards. But because of the girl's developing hair, Jade was sneezed and his soul came out of Yua Jung's body. And next thing you know, the father doesn't know what happened. Running to school and trying to catch her breath. To her great good fortune, De Young was fine and came to school as usual. Ajun is fine too. He is tired, sound and sweet asleep on his desk, listening to nothing. Everything seems to have gone well yesterday, and Jade Wan's little girl made it home safely. Suddenly, her head teacher, 
Hong Jaho, walks up to Dae Young and, smiling pleasantly, brings some class notes. And now it's break time. The two bitchy classmates of Dae Young's class aren't hitting on her this time, but on Yua Jung. After pushing Kyu Chu out of his seat, the girls sit on his chair and tell the sleeping Ajun that they want to talk to him after school, but he doesn't even move. He sleeps soundly and soundly. His classmates start shouting loudly in his ear, but it doesn't do any good either. In this school, the only one who can wake up Yua Jun is the coolest and most unique, Po Chu, the protagonist's cute friend, and he looks really cute. The classmates grudgingly ask to wake up this sleeping beauty. Shu leaned into his friend's ear and quietly said that the lesson was over. In an instant, Ha Jun happily woke up and grabbed his briefcase and was about to leave, when he was abruptly stopped by his classmates, putting him back in his seat. Ho Chu was pleased with his work. He was just like the only King Arthur, who can pull out Excalibur. Only here the only and unique, who can wake up Yuha. But then a classmate shut him up and finally told him again that she wants Jun to give them some time after class later. And especially Yi Jai wants to talk to him. He doesn't even know who Yi Jai is in the first place, which talked everyone, even the unwavering Yi Jai, who was putting on lipstick at this point and accidentally went over their outline. Jadwa, who had hidden himself so he wouldn't be seen by this kid, sat there trying not to laugh at the whole class. Ajun just asked his friend to wake him up when class was over, and then he just shoved his face back into his desk and fell asleep. He's a funny kid. The big building, allocated as a gymnasium. The boys were obviously playing basketball today, but the lesson was already over, and Ho Shu was left as the duty officer to arrange the balls. But the kind and sweet headman came up to him and said that he could go, and he would do everything for him. Thanking Jaho, the joyful cutie quickly ran out of the hall. But he had the feeling that he had forgotten something in the hall. What could it be? And it's Hua Jun, sleeping sweetly and soundly on the floor in the corner of the hall. At this time, while Jaho is picking up the balls, Dae Young comes up to him, holding out mint and chocolate flavored milk. The old man happily says thank you and that it's his favorite flavor. The two of them sat on a bench in the hall while Jaho drank his milk. Dae Young decided to thank the guy for walking her home today despite the fact that his house is on the exact opposite side. The headman joked about how hard the journey was afterward, and the girl laughed at his silly joke, lightly tapping her hand on her interlocutor's shoulder. Jaywa listens to them attentively, observing this, and he clearly doesn't like the strange atmosphere between them very much. Diyum is very grateful that Jiho helped her last night as well. Last night, when Joe had already left the kid's body, at the same time, the generous headman came in and swung at his sumba apologetically. But so, what happened last night anyway? The headmaster is Hong Jaho, a guy who always helps the teachers and is very well-mannered. He likes to play with his friends among us, where for some reason he is almost always considered an imposter. An imposter, a deceiver from among us. And he has a great relationship with his friends. He's an excellent student and always takes first places everywhere. Plus, he plays basketball as well as a professional. And there's no shortage of girls. Almost everyone thinks he's just beautiful and incredibly handsome. And then there's the popularity. He's not inferior to anybody. It is as if he had jumped out of some soap opera. But the eye of the incredible artist is not deceived. Usually always a character with puppy dog eyes and a smile. Something not so good as hiding. Now Yu the Jun is still sleeping in the corner of the gym, while the Yeon and Jaho have a nice chat and laugh. The girl thanks the guy for walking her home this morning. Jadhua overhears their whole conversation, and he clearly didn't like it. It's like this kid is trying to get close to his little girl on purpose. Dion also thanks the headman for helping her last night. So what happened last night anyway? We need to find out. So Jadhua will have to disturb poor Yu Jum again and inhabit his body. After school, when evening came, a beautiful sunset enveloped the whole town. Jadhua, seeing the headman came up to him, and asked for a conversation. They came again to the same deserted place where Dae Young had taken him yesterday. Even the sky was exactly the same shade, and there was a certain sense of déjà vu. Rubbing the back of his head awkwardly, Jaywa wondered what had happened yesterday. Jaho was a little surprised, but then just decided to tell him what really happened yesterday. Last night, when Jaywa sneezed and left the kid's body, Yu Jun became possessed of his body, and not expecting that he was running tripped over his own feet and fell face first into the asphalt and just passed out. Dion looked surprised at the guy and didn't know what to do. Jeho, on the other hand, couldn't let the moment pass him by and accelerated to catch them. But a footstep under King Kong's foot, who just as much hit his face on the pavement, stopped them. 
The ringleader looked at his bully in surprise and shouted who had just done it. It was Hong Jaho, who first apologized to Sunba and asked if he was okay, smiling so radiantly. PR. Sunba, addressing elders angry King Kong immediately got up and just as quickly got his fist in the face from the headman and fell back to the ground. The pink-haired guy didn't understand much at first, but then he noticed Hong Jaho and he seemed to know him. The guy rubbed the back of his head awkwardly, saying that he was just passing by and so he met some much-admired Sumba, who wanted to attack his classmates. Standing up in a fighting stance, he was ready to attack, and that beaming smile and arrogance really annoyed Jaiho. This boy seemed to copy him. The headman punched this pink-haired boy a couple of times well, and still keeps apologizing and caringly asking if everything is okay. Chivo keeps threatening, because the consequences could be severe for someone beating up the head of the monkeys. Continuing to act fake, Hong Jae-ho pulls his phone out of his pocket and starts showing what good deeds this pink-haired aide has done. How he made school kids eat food off the floor. How he sat smoking outside the school and humiliated some guy. How he swung at a girl and most importantly is where Kwok Jae-ho is all tattooed gang leader 12 and beat up some other school kid too. Now Javo has the upper hand here and now he's threatening, because if this all gets posted on Instagram, the future of the idol is over. But he only laughed and felt no fear now from such a threat. Jong Sung Young's name immediately turned off his whole arrogant nature. His lips and whole body trembled, and Hong Ji Ho only shouted loudly and angrily that the pink-haired man was a fucking murderer. Now Kwak, Ja Ho looked truly helpless. Two years ago at Jinho High School, the ninth grade class chooses who they will send to this year's school festival. And the class says without a doubt that it should be Kwok Jaho. The guy sits at the last desk, smiling slightly embarrassed. And his hair is not yet a shade of pink, just a light yellow color. But suddenly the class remembered another classmate, Jo Sung Yeun, who was also a musician and ran his own YouTube channel. He was a real schoolboy, with elongated glasses and the same kind of hair on his head. The whole class, along with the teacher, decided that they would perform together then and came up with a joint performance. The guys went outside during the break, and sitting on the steps, Jeho found his classmate's YouTube channel, and there, he was making music from whatever he could find, like bottles of peas, iron buckets instead of rams, and a big bottle with a thin wire stretched over it instead of a guitar. And with a loop station device, this guy was making music out of literally all kinds of garbage. PP Loop Station is a recorder for recording looped musical phrases and playing them back in real time. Jeho seemed to really like that, saying that Sung Yen actually makes music out of any crap. He replied that not all things are crap, they all have meaning, and that's what his father used to say. Then Jeho remembered what his father told him. Usually it was that he was a worthless and useless asshole, and that he wasn't doing any good with his dancing. His father was very different from his classmate's father. Jiho immediately changed the subject by continuing to discuss music. It also turns out that Jo Sung Neon can record good covers, which he's pretty good at. And even though the would-be idol is being kind to this guy, his arrogance is still the same at heart. But he decided to invite his now partner to his studio to get ready for the festival. He was about to show his surprise that it was his own studio, but didn't have time and got kicked in the face by a bully, causing his glasses and himself to fly off in different directions. Kim Kyu Chol, ninth grader who did this and called Ji Ho over to smoke with them. He awkwardly agreed and left, leaving his classmate alone. Oak Entertainment. His manager was a little surprised that Ji Ho was here today, but he replied that he was with a buddy and they would just be sitting in his studio. The huge amount of expensive equipment really and sincerely surprised his classmate, and he modestly asked permission to touch it. Ji Ho was a little embarrassed by this, but allowed it. They sat down on couches and started to work out a performance plan. Jaho mostly suggested something. His partner agreed with him, wrote it down in his notes, and he sat there proud of himself. The would-be idol noticed some pretty fresh cuts visible under the sleeve of Sung Yen's shirt. Jaho decided to broach the subject of what happened today. This bully treats everyone unkindly, but he treats Sung Yen in a particularly cruel way. And that's because he liked a girl in high school and asked Sung Yen to compose a song and he refused. And from that moment on, that bully had a crush on him. It's a small thing, but Shaw will never forgive him for that now. Although Son Nian could just write one song and then tell him to fuck off, but he can't. That guy has such principles, because if there's no sincerity in the song, it's not his song. He didn't like that girl, and he can't write a confession song. Son Nian asked to, of course, 
It looks like Jeho was friends with them, since they then called him along. But really this whole friendship was only held because of his father. They think that if they are friends with the director's son Dot, they will have at least some chance to meet the star. After a while, the guys ordered a delivery of various fast food items and decided to grab a bite to eat. So Mian told his conversation partner that he doesn't have a mom, and that he and his dad and his little sister live in a threesome. Chewing on a burger, Jiho asked that they get away from the family topic. But for some reason, Sung Yeon thought it was a good idea since he doesn't know much about him. And Jaho in turn has three mothers. It even made the bespectacled man laugh. Afterwards, Zhang Sung Yeon thanked Jaiho for inviting him over and for having a good time. The next time Jaiho is invited to Sung Yeon's house, they'll be treating them to a meal. And his dad can cook just as well as top chefs. Jaho will indeed taste his father's food, but only at Zhang Sung Yeon's funeral, when his picture will be hung with the black ribbon. A certain amount of time will pass from that day of promise, because already Jaiho will be covered in some kind of abrasions and his hair will be pink. He will sit shocked and stare long and silently at the plate of this soup. Students sit in the school cafeteria and squeamishly look at today's food. The bullies sit at a separate table, and Jaiho sits with them. They take all the food, cigarettes, and garbage, and mix it into a huge, disgusting-looking mass. Zhang Sung Yeon walks by them, and the guys call him up, and make him eat this high-quality dish from the great chefs, so he doesn't walk around so skinny like he's half-dead. But in addition to eating this horror, they also demand money, 10,001. He stands shocked and doesn't know what to say. Jeho decides to stand up for him, because he thinks it's already too much and accidentally pushes the tray, and he falls to the floor. The bullies think he did it on purpose, so that Sung Nian would lick that disgusting dish off the floor like a dog. There is complete silence in the dining room but no one plans to stand up for this guy. Everyone is scared, so he silently and disgustedly leans to the floor and starts to lick it all off. Oak Entertainment Building, it's late afternoon, and Jaho and Sung Yin are practicing together for the festival. The idol tries to teach his partner some normal moves to perform on stage afterwards. He only awkwardly apologizes because this is his first time dancing and asks them to try again. After a while, they sit tiredly on the studio floor drinking some kind of cocktail. Sung Yeon liked dancing today, even though it didn't turn out particularly well. Today's situation in the canteen was stressful for Jia Ho, but his classmate said it was okay. Conversely, if Kwok got into trouble because of him, he would feel guilty about it. Ignoring is not the lot of coordus. No one can hurt Zhang Sung Yeon unless he himself allows it, but Hatma Gandhi said so, and no bullying can get him. Here, Jia Ho shuts him up by shoving a cocktail into his mouth. He's pissed off by these outpourings of his soul and immediately takes away the subject of music, and, taking the expensive camera, they go off to try to record a song. This moment where Jaiho is standing in front of a picture of his classmate, which is tied with a black ribbon, and there are candles all around. Nonviolence, then Sung Yen was wrong. The evening after school, the bullies in Jaiho catch Zhang Sung Yen again and beat him up behind the school, extorting money from him as well. The classmate's glasses fly away and Kwok can't take it anymore and says they should go, and then Kim Ju Chol notices that this type of future idol doesn't participate in their tutorials, and often goes along with this nerd, most likely because he's popular on YouTube or, as rumors say, just wants to take Sung Yen's channel away from him. And many recognize this kid as a talent, even that bully, and Jaho is just supposedly showing off just because of his dad and has no talent whatsoever and then anyone can become an idol if they become a talentless person like that. These words are really starting to piss Jiho off, because Chol has now crossed the line. But the bullies aren't afraid of him at all, because they are already being harassed by high school students. And if the would-be idol doesn't want to be like his battered classmate, then let him prove that he's not a wimp. Chol pointed his finger at Zhang Sung Yeon, who was sitting on the ground and couldn't really see anything without his glasses. Jaho walked up to him planning to take a swing at him, to which Sun Yeon quietly told him that it was okay and it wasn't hurt, but instead of hitting him, the guy put his glasses back on his face. Taking off his shirt and sweatshirt, he threw his stuff to his classmate to wipe away the blood, and now he's going to fight the scumbags himself so that they can then take Sun Yeon hostage. The bullies look at him angrily and unhappily, not understanding what he's about to do. To which, Jaho replies to them that they would be honored to get it from a future idol like him. The guy is feeling cocky and ready for a fight.